Hi everybody, my name is Miss Eckert and I usually teach at Stanislaw Elementary School in West Seattle. But for now, like you, I'm at home. And right now I'm very grateful for books because those have been my friends during this long, long period at home. I hope you have some good books or some books that you can read online to keep you company too. Today I'm going to be reviewing some things about expository nonfiction, which is a genre you've probably heard about. If you can't remember, we'll just revisit it today. Expository nonfiction often uses these text features. The author writes about things that are true and real information, generally some facts. In this one, in this chart, I'm showing that expository nonfiction uses photographs, captions that tell more about the photographs. Often in expository nonfiction, you'll find a table of contents where you can find certain chapters in the book, an index, some bold words that are often um, defined in the glossary, and many other text features like maps, diagrams, or text boxes. In today's book, you're going to hear expository nonfiction text called Flashy, Fantastic Rainforest Frogs, written by Dorothy Hinshaw Patton and illustrated by Kendall Jan Jubb. In this expository nonfiction, you're going to hear a lot of true facts about rainforest frogs, but you won't necessarily find a lot of the text features that are on our chart. The illustrator, instead of using photographs, has chosen to draw things and paint things. This is a picture of the rainforest. Most of us have never been to a rainforest, but they grow thickly with plants and trees. They are located in warm parts of the earth with lots and lots of rainfall. Many different kinds of animals and plants live there, including monkeys, parrots, leopards, crocodiles, frogs. They all live in tropical rainforests. Before we read, I want you to get your brain ready for the information that's to come by asking yourself some questions. The first question is, what do you think you know about frogs, the topic of our book? Think about what you've seen, heard, read about frogs that you know in your life already. And based on what you know, what do you wonder about frogs that live in a rainforest? What questions might you have about them? When we ask ourselves questions and we wonder about things, we get our brains ready for some learning that we might find out in the book. We may not, but the author often answers some questions and wonderings that we have along the way. That helps us become more active learners. We think about what we're going to be reading before we read it, and our brain is actively engaged in the reading as we go along with the pages. A couple of things I've heard third graders wonder before are these things. Are rainforest frogs like pond frogs? And why are rainforest frogs so colorful? Those are two wonderings third graders and fourth graders have had in the past. Let's find out if our author addresses these questions as we read. Flashy, fantastic rainforest frogs. This book is published by the Developmental Studies Center. The first part of the, read, the, the section I read is going to tell about the different kinds of rainforest frogs. Listen for information that you didn't know before. Flashy and fantastic. Flashy means colorful and bright. That's what rainforest frogs are. They aren't just green or brown like ordinary frogs. They can be blue or orange. 
They may have red stripes or pink bellies. Some are smaller than your thumb. And others are as big as kittens. They look different from frogs near your home, but in important ways, they are the same. Like all frogs, they have moist skin, big eyes, and long hind legs. The males croak to attract females, which then lay eggs without shells. I'm going to stop here. And based on what you just heard, what are you wondering? I've heard some third graders add the question, why don't frogs eggs have shells? Let's see if we find out if our question or our wonder is answered as we read on. The males croak to attract females, which then lay eggs without shells. The next part of the book I'm going to read describes the tropical rainforest habitat, or where the frogs live. The tropical rainforest is a very special place. It never freezes. Instead of summer and winter, the rainforest has a wet and a dry season. Even during the dry season, it often rains. The rainforest looks like a tropical garden. Plants grow everywhere, even on other plants. At the top of the rainforest is the canopy, where the trees spread their leaves to gather sunlight. Below the canopy is the understory. The understory is made up of tree trunks, vines, and bushes. The forest floor is shaded by the plants above. So often, little grows there. Based on what you just heard, what are you wondering now? A couple more questions pop into our brains at various times in the book. It's a good thing to encourage our questions. It still keeps us actively engaged as we read the rest of the story. Some questions I've heard are, which part of the rainforest do the frogs live in? Do they live in the upper part called the canopy, the next level called the understory, or the forest floor? And why do frogs need such a wet place to live. Again, we're acting our brain, activating our brain so that we can learn more information that the author tells us and see if the author answers any of our questions. The forest floor is shaded by the plants above, so often little grows there. The last part I'm going to read aloud today tells where frogs live in the rainforest and what they eat. Many frogs live in the canopy and the understory. They may never come down to the ground. Their legs are long and thin for climbing from branch to branch. Their toes have wide, sticky tips that help them cling or hold on to the branches and leaves. Other frogs spend their whole lives on the forest floor and never enter the water. They don't need to because the air is so wet. Only a few live in or near ponds and streams. Most rainforest frogs eat insects. There are so many crickets, moths, termites, ants, and other insects in the forest that frogs have plenty to eat. Big frogs may go beyond eating insects. Some large horned frogs have green and brown bodies that blend perfectly or match camouflage with the forest floor. These frogs don't hunt for food. 
They just sit and wait. They can eat almost anything that comes their way, even mice and small rats. Let's add another question to our chart. Students have added after this point in the text. How can a frog swallow a rat or a mouse? It is interesting to think a small animal like a frog could swallow something as big as a mouse or a rat. I'm curious to see if the author tells us in the, the answer to this question in the next section of the book. We will stop here for today and continue wondering and questioning tomorrow. But for now, let's think a little bit about what we've learned and read about so far. At the beginning of the book, we learned a, bit, a little bit about how rainforest frogs looked their sizes and colors, and that they lived in moist places. We also learned that they live in a tropical rainforest and saw pictures of a tropical rainforest and what it looks like. We learned there are several parts of the tr tropical rainforest, the canopy, the understory, and the forest floor. We also learned where some of the forest frogs lived. Using the pictures to help us retell a story also helps us remember what we read. So I do like to use that as a strategy when I'm thinking about what I learned and understood in a book. And we also learned that rainforest frogs eat a lot of insects that are found in different places, such as bugs, crickets, termites and moths, small rats and mice as well, which led us to a wonder about how they can swallow something so big when they're apparently rather small. Let's go back to our chart about our wonderings and questions and see if the author answered any of our, our wonderings. We did find out that rainforest frogs were alike in some ways and different in some ways than pond frogs. They differed in their colors and sometimes in their sizes and the fact that they lived in very wet climates all the time and warm. Another wondering we had was why rainforest frogs are so colorful. The author hasn't answered that question yet, but may at some point. We wondered where the tiny frogs lived. Was it in the canopy? or the understory or the forest floor? And which part of the rainforest do the frogs live in? We also wondered why their eggs didn't have shells. In our reading, the author hasn't answered that question, but again, maybe tomorrow. And why do frogs need such a wet place to live? It did talk about them needing to be in warm, wet climates in the story, but we didn't know exactly why. And how can a frog swallow a rat or mouse, which is yet to be answered as well. So now that we have a lot of wonderings and questions, we'll listen for those things tomorrow as we read aloud some more and find out if the author answers or the illustrator answers any of our questions. Again, doing this gets our mind ready to learn information and be an active participant as stories are read to us or as we read. Today, during your IDR, I would like you to spend some time listening to a story or reading a story, a nonfiction expository is best, to see what you can learn and wonder about as you read. Remember that the books that you can choose during independent reading time can be in whatever language you're comfortable with. One thing we want to focus on when we're reading and we come to something that's difficult or that we don't understand 
is how to use a fix-up strategy to make it more understandable to us. Here are two IDR fix-up strategies that we've learned so far. We can go and reread the confusing part slowly and carefully. I often do this when I'm reading books, especially nonfiction books, on a subject I don't know much about, to see if I can go back, reread it again, slowly, and think more carefully the second time. What is the author teaching me or telling me here? I am reading a book, a nonfiction, or it's a biography about Ruth Bader Ginsburg right now. She's one of the Supreme Court justices. And in this book, there's a lot of difficult parts. I don't really understand law very well. For example, over here, this page kind of made me very confused. So when I went back and reread it, I made sure to pay attention to the sidebars here to give me some more information and help explain what was going on in this part of the book, what the laws actually meant. So I reread, and once I reread, I could figure out the part that was more confusing to me. Another strategy that you can use is read ahead to look for more information. You don't have to read very far ahead maybe just a page, to see if some information that the author is about to give us will, will help us understand what we're currently reading. Those are two IDR fix-up strategies that I would like you to use today as you read your nonfiction text. Remember, you can reread the confusing part, see if it gives you any more help to understand what's happening, or read ahead for a page or a paragraph to look for more information. Sometimes when we get questions in our head and think, I don't really understand that, if you reread ahead a little bit, it will give you information that will help you understand your questions. Please reuse those strategies today as you're reading your nonfiction book. I'd also like to share with you today some ways you can find some nonfiction titles online. Seattle Public Schools has a great website. At the top in your search bar, type in seattleschools.org. Then you'll see at the very top in the black bar, if you press the little down arrow, you can access online academic resources. Click there. It takes a little while for it to come. And then once you get to the online academic resources page, you'll see a variety of things that you can look at to find nonfiction texts at your level. Two resources that I really love, especially for primary grades, are Pebble Go and Tumble Books. Both of them offer lots of nonfiction topics of any variety of topics that you might be interested in animals, plants, weather, volcanoes, you choose. There's a variety of topics there that are really interesting to read. You could use either of those for your independent reading time today. You can use books that you have at your house. You can use articles that you find online or magazines that you might have at your house. Also, I want to show you Britannica and Britannica Spanish are great ways to find other nonfiction texts. And if you have a Seattle Public Library card, you can go to the eBooks or the Seattle Public Library to check out books, nonfiction or fiction. But in this case, we're really trying to use our strategies of wondering and questioning for expository nonfiction. I hope you find a good book to read tonight or today, and remember that at least 20 to 25 minutes of independent reading time using your fix-up strategies will help you become a better reader and a better thinker and learner. I hope to see you again tomorrow, and I've enjoyed being on TV with you. Have a great afternoon.